Can I take the opportunity to remind members of the COVID-related measures that are in place and that face coverings should be worn while moving around the chamber and across the Holyrood campus? Uh, the next item of business is a debate without motion on Scotland's approach to 2021 uh, coastal state negotiations. I would invite members who wish to contribute to the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible, or if they're joining us online, to put an R in the chat function. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary to open the debate for around 11 minutes. Ms Gujon. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Now, this debate on fishing negotiations comes at a time when the world has gathered in Glasgow, taking stock of efforts to preserve our planet for future generations. And the theme of sustainability and preservation of biodiversity has to be one that runs through all of our policies, all of our discussions and our laws. The Scottish Government recognises the critical role our oceans and seas play in our daily lives, as well as mitigating and adapting to climate change. Last week's Ocean, Day, Ocean Action Day during COP26 showed us why and how we need to challenge ourselves and the global community to act faster. We need to do more to ensure healthy, safe, productive and biologically diverse oceans for today and for tomorrow. This debate also comes at a time when the Scottish fishing industry continues to face significant challenges. Brexit and the COVID-19 pandemic have hit Scotland's seafood industry hard. From Shetland to Eyemouth to the Western Isles to the Clyde, I've been listening to fishers and processors, hearing firsthand how their businesses and livelihoods have been harmed. We want a fishing industry that is resilient, robust and sustainable. A fishing industry that delivers for Scotland. Realising this goal means finding a balance between environmental, social and economic considerations, protecting both our fishermen and our stunning and diverse marine environment. And getting this balance right is in everyone's interest. As one Scottish skipper noted recently, you have to make sure you're guaranteeing a future in the job. It's in my interest to fish within sustainable levels. A healthy marine environment is crucial to supporting a sustainable fishing and seafood industry. The year-end negotiations with our coastal state partners are a crucial part of getting this balance right. The Fisheries Act of 2020 makes it clear under its sustainability objective that fisheries managers should find middle ground between economic and ecological considerations. Our negotiation position is based on taking pragmatic and informed management decisions on appropriate levels of total allowable catches. And we must follow the direction of the scientific advice towards maximum sustainable yield. However, we also have a responsibility to manage the increases and decreases recommended by science, avoiding large fluctuations in total allowable catch, which could negatively impact on the in industry and the markets. Now, this sometimes requires taking a more incremental approach towards achieving maximum sustainable yield in the interests of the broader sustainability of a given fishery. Now, our position in negotiations is therefore informed by the principle of total allowable catch constraints, and we believe it's appropriate to limit TAC variances year on year for individual stocks by 20%. The TAC constraint, which is in line with international good practice, allows us to move in the direction of the scientific advice while avoiding peaks and troughs in TACs, which would be economically damaging. This kind of active and pragmatic management is particularly important in the context of this year's negotiations. Almost one year on from the signature of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, the shortcomings of the reckless Brexit deal are already plain for all to see. Scotland's fishermen are particularly scunnered by what many of them now realise as a sellout of their and our industry. The Scottish Fishermen's Federation has labelled the deal as desperately poor and the worst of both worlds for industry. A report published in September this year, prepared by a former DEFRA negotiator, has confirmed our own analysis at the time that, far from increasing prosperity, the TCA will lead to a loss for the industry. Much of the vaunted increase from the TCA is a paper fish, a fact we highlighted at the time the agreement was made. And for various reasons, it will therefore not be caught and it will add no value to Scotland's economy or coastal communities. It's no wonder, presiding officer, that Scotland's fishermen feel a sense of Brexit betrayal. Now, this situation has been exacerbated by COVID-19. Uh, yes. Jimmy Hulker Johnson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary, the Secretary for taking that intervention. When she's been speaking to fishermen, um, can she tell me how many have told her that they want to follow the SNP's policy of returning into the EU and therefore 
back into the common fisheries policy, having regained control of our waters. Cabinet Secretary. The biggest issues that I hear about when I'm speaking to, the, the, to fishers and people within the seafood industry, the length and breadth of Scotland, are about the issues that I'm outlining here. And amongst a lot of that as well is labour. That's a big issue. Now, the situation has been exacerbated by COVID-19, which has forced boats to remain tied up at quaysides and driven volatility in the market. The results of a Marine Scotland survey last year showed that 73% of sea fisheries businesses relied solely or partly on government support to continue operating. These findings underline the importance of this government's actions to get help to Scotland's fishers, processors and small fish and seafood farmers as fast as we could last year. We were the first government in the UK to act and we literally helped save many from much harsher financial harm. Now we are faced with some difficult scientific advice for 2022. Proposed cuts to key stocks are a real concern for communities up and down Scotland which rely on fishing for their livelihoods. The advice also highlights the precarious nature of some stocks which must be protected and preserved for future generations. Presiding officer, this is indeed a challenging context. However, I want to reassure this chamber that this government is focused on getting the best possible deal for Scotland. Marine officials are working hard, even as I speak, promoting our interests in international negotiations with other coastal states. And I'm pleased to say that we've reached agreement with our coastal states' neighbours on total catch limits for 2022, in line with ICE's advice for mackerel, blue whiting and Atlantoscandian herring. The first round of our trilateral negotiations with the EU and Norway was productive, and we look forward to hosting the second round here in Edinburgh next week. In addition, the first round of the UK-EU bilateral negotiation starts tomorrow. While the timescales for negotiation are uncertain and depend on the willingness of our international partners to negotiate, it's our hope to conclude discussions by the middle of December, allowing fishers to enter a new fishing year with more clarity, certainty and, I hope, optimism than in recent years. Presiding officer, we are conscious of our obligation to balance the needs of the present with the interests of the future. And this is clearly set out in both our fisheries management strategy published last December and the cooperation agreement made with the Scottish Greens. The fisheries management strategy will drive an inclusive approach to fisheries management. Uh, yes. Rachel Hamilton. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that through the Green and SNP coalition that there is no threat to uh, cuts in quota, considering that the conservation aspect of fisheries is devolved. Cabinet Secretary. I mean, we will continue to have these discussions and we'll be setting out and consulting on our future ca uh, catching policy uh, early next year, where, of course, we will have all of these discussions. Now, we want to bring people together, ensuring that a range of po uh, voices are heard to collaborate on finding solutions. This government will continue to engage with stakeholders at every level to achieve this. Now, this approach is epitomised in the recent NEFROPS Working Group, which published a report on the 15th of September this year. Today, we responded to the recommendations set out in that report. And fundamentally, we're all agreed that we need to strengthen the resilience of the seafood industry here in Scotland. And a key aspect is to strengthen links to local and global markets. Of course, that objective would be easier to deliver with a level trading playing field and access to the skilled labour they require. Now, the UK government did not need to force us out of free trade and freedom of movement with the EU, but they did, and our seafood industry is paying the price. I want to reassure our coastal communities that we will continue to do all we can with the resources available to us to continue to supply high quality seafood to consumers both here at home and abroad. And we will of course continue to press the UK government for measures to address labour shortages and to help rather than hinder efforts to export our quality product to our most lucrative market which is the EU. Now, although recent experience suggests that it, will, that it will continue to be our industry put in harm's way at every opportunity that the Tories want to manufacture a problem to disguise the sheer awfulness of the deal that they agreed to on leaving the EU, we must also use our own powers, though, to make our own industry more resilient. And that includes onshore as well as offshore. This government has long been committed to applying an economic license, a link licence condition to fishing opportunity. So I can announce today that following consultation in the previous parliamentary session, we will move to increase the amount of catch landed into Scottish ports by introducing new economic link arrangements for Scottish vessels in 2023. There are a wide range of other commitments in the 12-point action plan contained within our fisheries management strategy. These include introducing a new catching policy, enhancing our knowledge and evidence base through the introduction of remote electronic monitoring to key parts of the fishing fleet and working to mitigate the impact of climate change on our seas. The cooperation agreement with the Scottish Greens incorporates these commitments, but it also goes further. 
The Scottish Government and the Scottish Green Party believe that the marine environment should be clean, healthy, safe, productive and diverse, and managed to meet the long-term needs of nature and people. As part of this vision, we are determined to make a step change in marine protection and to deliver on our shared commitment to achieve and maintain good environmental status for all of Scotland's seas, offshore and inshore. The measures we have agreed for enhanced marine, marine protection will make Scotland an international leader in this field. We specifically commit to restoring marine habitats in Scotland's inshore waters with the aim of achieving good environmental status, recognising that those waters contain valuable blue carbon hotspots, nursery grounds for fish stocks and an array of rich marine wildlife and biodiversity. And specific actions will include enhancing marine protection through marine protected areas and new highly protected marine areas, taking specific measures to protect the inshore seabed and extending the requirement for vessel tracking and monitoring systems across the whole commercial fleet by the end of the current parliamentary session. Making progress on delivering these commitments will be our priority in the coming year. Presiding officer, this government is wholly committed to addressing the twin crises of climate and biodiversity. Increasingly, the world is realising that adapting to climate change while also seeking to slow global warming is a marine as well as a land challenge. Scotland's already playing its part. Indeed, we're on part of a groundbreaking and world-leading activity on blue carbon. And tomorrow, I'll open an international blue carbon conference here in Scotland, the first ever to be held at the same time as a UN climate conference. This is the first time oceans have had such prominence in the UN climate change programme, with hundreds of ocean and marine events taking place over the course of COP26. This is a welcome development and an important step to build understanding of the importance of protecting our ocean and the role it can play in climate change mitigation, adaptation and resilience to drive action. Now, there's no doubt that facing up to and addressing these intertwined challenges is difficult. The last few years have been a time of, const uh, of constant upheaval for Scotland's fishing and seafood sectors. And at times it's felt, in the words of one of my favourite authors, uh, Lewis Grassic Gibbon, that nothing is true but change. The shock of the COVID-19 pandemic added to a Brexit deal that has utterly failed and undermined our industry has wrought unwelcome uncertainty among our fishing communities and partners for an endeavour that's always challenging and often dangerous. And all of this is taking place in the wider context of the twin crises of biodiversity loss and climate change, which pose a real and imminent danger to our country and our planet. However, this government isn't sitting on the sidelines. We have a vision, a strategy to make our fishing industry sustainable, both economically and ecologically. We're act acting to resolve these issues and give the fishing industry a renewed sense of certainty. We're fiercely defending Scotland's interests in international quota negotiations, and we're bringing the best available science to bear on the current and future management of our fisheries. We have a team of some of the most experienced and competent negotiators in Europe to support our industry objectives. And we're working with others to protect our shared marine heritage, leading in international collaboration in areas such as blue carbon habitats and storage. We may be facing challenges, but as we continue to face this uncertainty and change, I'm resolved to do what this government does best, which is stand up for, promote and protect Scotland's interests at all times. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, before calling the next speaker, I can advise the Chamber we've got a little time in hand, so anybody that takes interventions will get that time back. And Rachel Hamilton, uh, for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to first start by um, thanking and paying tribute to the fishing industry for its resilience and to all who work in the seafood supply chain. In my own constituency, we were reminded uh, recently of the perils of the sea when the town of Eyemouth marked the 140th anniversary of the Eyemouth disaster, when 189 fishermen were drowned on a stormy night in October 1881. Our fishermen risk their lives in all weathers so that we have food on our plates, and we must never forget that. As a result of our exit from the EU, the uh, UK and Scotland are now independent coastal states, giving us, or an independent coastal state, giving us control over our own waters. And it, we on these benches feel that it is a fantastic uh, chapter of opportunity for our fishing communities. Because fisheries are a devolved matter, many of the powers that were exercised at the EU level before Brexit are now held by Scottish ministers. And the devolution of fisheries is further consolidated by the Fisheries Act of, 19, uh, of 2020, which confers a broad regulatory power on the Scottish ministers with the scope of devolved competence for a conservation purpose or a fishing industry purpose. In opening today for the Scottish Conservatives, I would like to make a number of points on standing up for fishing communities, on vital funding and sustainability. 
Firstly, presiding officer, as a result of the UK's exit from the EU, the UK is now an independent coastal state with control over our waters for the first time in decades. Not only have we managed to secure additional quota worth around 146 million over the next five years, it will be shared across the UK. Yes. Emma Harper. I thank Rachel Hamilton for taking an intervention. Does she not agree that the UK negotiated on the principle of leaving the EU and not actually working for the fishing industry? Rachel Hamilton. Well, the trade and cooperation agreement with the EU, uh, which was agreed in December 2020, uh, gives British fishermen the right to catch more fish in UK waters. And I know that Emma Harper is very interested in separating our country and taking us right back into the common fisheries policy, which was hated by many fishermen right across the country. And that is why we should work together to make the most of the opportunities that we have in front of us. So I was talking there about the uh, shared additional quota across Britain, and this will benefit those parts of the UK where active fishers have demonstrated that they both need and can catch those stocks. And I'll talk about that later in the speech. But the Scottish Conservatives, we on these benches, have repeatedly stood up for fishing communities since the EU departure. And when it comes to funding, Scotland's other government have stepped up to the mark on providing the industry with additional support. Can the member take an intervention? Yes. Cabinet Secretary. Well, would the member care to elaborate then on why in the replacement for the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund, Scotland received only £14 million as opposed to the £62 million it should have received? Mr Hamilton. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that intervention. But the Scottish Government have received a number of tranches of funding, um, in particular the recent funding uh, which is going to actually give, give access to develop technology, to increase the number of skills, opportunities. And further into um, my contribution today, I want to actually speak about the lack of help from the Scottish Government with regards to young entrants into the industry. But moving back to what the, the UK Government did in terms of their support, um, we opened a £23 million fund to support fishing communities across Scotland through disruption related to the UK's case exit to the EU. And I think it's important that we did recognise, or the UK government did recognise, that uh, businesses did need support at this crucial time. And that mitigated uh, losses to businesses caused by delays related to the export of fresh or live fish and shellfish to the EU. And that was an important bit of funding. Um, the UK government also bolstered support with the 100 million UK seafood fund, and that has been a vital lifeline to level up coastal communities across Scotland. And the first part of this vital funding was announced in September 2021, 20, uh, and that means that, as I said to the Cabinet Secretary, that there is an Im important opportunity there to invest and develop technology and trial new gear and support world-class research to improve the productivity and long-term sustainability of the industry, which is really important in the conversations that we've had during COP26. It will also um, enable the industry to process more fish landed in the UK, uh, create the job opportunities that we need across that supply chain and upskill the workforce and train new entrants, as well as uh, uh, cutting edge um, technology in new safe and sustainable um, methods. So, presiding officer, I am concerned that a number of members on the SNP uh, benches are dragging us back to constitutional arguments, and it just highlights the attitude of the SNP government towards our fantastic coastal communities. So, uh, if, if I take um, the example of, that I, I was making there of my uh, constituent, um, if I, I, I actually can't find his example here, but um, yeah, it, it's, it's about banging the drum for getting young people into the industry. Um, it concerns me greatly uh, that I wrote to the Cabinet Secretary for Finance uh, recently regarding a loan for a fishing um, licence for a, a young constituent of mine who's looking for help um, as he, he, with his... He's, get, he's got a fishing vessel and he wants uh, to, to a licence. And um, he was told that uh, on the basis that cost of licensing a vessel is an operational statutory cost of business, it's considered, and I quote, to be a relatively poor return in terms of public investment for the limited funding 
which has been historically available to the industry. And simply put, presiding officer, that confirms that the SNP are not standing up for young people who want to enter this thriving industry. It's a sad state of affairs for the next generation, I'm afraid. And to add insult to injury, and to quote further, the Minister said, better value in terms of investment return are also achieved from assisting industry with aid directed at non-statutory investments such as quality improvements, safety infrastructure and market-related initiatives where added value is achieved. It just shows a lack of understanding about how we want to take an independent coastal state in terms of the activity of all those communities across uh, Scotland into the fishing industry and really, really get the fishing industry thriving again. And my final point, uh, presiding officer, I want to uh, touch on the uh, cod stocks. And the um, SFA, along with the Scottish White Fish Producers Association, have asked both the Scottish and the UK government to create an independent panel to assess the International Council for Exploration of Seas uh, numbers and put them into proper perspective. Fishermen have warned Scottish ministers to think twice about cutting cod quotas next year after figures show that there were 285 million of the fish in the North Sea. And the ICES is recommending a reduction in the total allowable catch for North Sea cod of 10.3%, even though it also admits that doubling quotas for the species would mean an increase of 24% in the size of stock by 2023. We know North Sea cod is abundant with a population of up to 180 million in 2018, but green NGOs constantly uh, describe cod as threatened or endangered as a risk of extinction. Yet, perhaps, presiding officer, picture is very different, and that is why I asked the Cabinet Secretary in an intervention whether there is a threat from the SNP Green Coalition of them cutting quotas, um, considering that, that the aspect of conservation is devolved. So, in conclusion, presiding officer, the CFP is unavoidable with EU membership, and that only comes with um, the SNP Green Coalition, the Nationalist Coalition, uh, breaking up the United Kingdom. And our fishermen do not want to be dictated to by Brussels. And it's time that both of Scotland's governments work together for the benefit of Scotland's fishing communities. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Hamilton. I now call on uh, Colin Smith for around six minutes, Mr Smith. President officer, I want to place on record my thanks to Scotland's fishers who, who go to sea every day in the most dangerous peacetime occupation to put food on all our tables, in a sector that provides thousands of jobs, often in some of Scotland's most fragile rural communities, and generates more than £300 million a year in gross value added, with the processing sector contributing more than this again. Faced with the twin shocks of the collapse of markets during COVID lockdowns and a deal to leave the EU that no one is surprised failed to deliver what Scotland's fishing sector needed or was promised in an industry that has shown remarkable resilience. The impact of that Brexit deal was entirely predictable, devastating delays in getting products to the market, entirely predictable increases in labour shortages, particularly crippling fish processors, and entirely predictable trading disputes. It is in the context of that deal, those challenges, that the next round of coastal state negotiations will take place. But it is also in the context of a renewed focus on the importance of our precious marine environment in tackling the climate crisis and the need to prioritise sustainability, not just because it is the right thing to do environmentally, but because it is the right thing to do to secure the long-term economic viability of the industry. The Scottish Government has opted to, to largely rely on the UK Fisheries Act to determine the framework for these negotiations, even in devolved areas, rather than deliver a Scottish Fisheries Act. But decisions on fisheries management in Scotland rest with Scottish ministers. While fishers themselves have a role to play in responsible management of the seas, it is Scottish ministers who decide on how our seas are used. So, ahead of this year's discussions and negotiations, I want to set out five tests from Labour for the Scottish Government on the establishment and distribution of sustainable fishing quota for 2022. Firstly, we believe that fish and catch quotas should not exceed scientific advice for maximum sustainable yield in 2022. Now, I appreciate delivering against fixed MSY targets in mixed fisheries where stocks are subject to individually fluctuating scientific advice is challenging. It requires close cooperation across the UK and beyond. But overfishing depletes our public fish asset and reduces the amount available 
for subsequent years. So Labour will assess the outcome of the forthcoming negotiations from Scottish ministers and how total quota allowances compare to scientific advice, whether it tackles overfishing and whether there is a genuine commitment from the Scottish Government not to exceed maximum sustainable yield. Secondly, we will assess the actions of ministers and whether negotiations deliver a fairer, more diverse distribution of quota allocation in Scotland, sometime, something the Cabinet Secretary was silent on in her opening comments. Fish quotas have become a, a tradable asset sold and leased for profit. It has become highly consolidated. For example, four companies control 55 per cent of the North Sea mackerel quota. The benefit is no longer being shared amongst a fleet of smaller vessels, but instead concentrated to those few owners who operate very large boats. The Scottish Government should instigate an immediate review of how quotas are allocated to assess what more can be done to deliver Section 25 of the UK Fisheries Act the best social, economic and environmental outcomes for Scotland. Thirdly, Labour believes in the principle that Scottish seafood should be landed in Scotland. At present, far too much is landed abroad, bypassing Scotland's economy, food system and jobs. For example, 55 per cent of mackerel caught by Scottish fishing vessels last year was landed directly to a foreign port. The Scottish Government has done little to date to prevent this beyond consulting, and we will assess very carefully the announcement that the Cabinet Secretary has just made. But we need proper investment in building capacity and infrastructure and fishing keys and within the processing sector to secure more landing in Scottish ports, helping to regenerate our all too often neglected coastal communities. Fourthly, we believe that quota should be used to incentivise a change towards lower impact and less bycatch forms of fishing. We know that some methods of fishing cause serious environmental harm. Scotland's marine assessment in 2020 found that fishing was the most significant and widespread pressure on Scotland's seas, noting particularly that bottom trawling and other mobile bottom contact and fishing methods have led to widespread changes to the marine ecosystem. The pressure associated with damaging methods can be reduced and the impacts mitigated through restrictions on such methods, backed by a just transition to ensure that fishers are supported, but also through proper incentives. Additionally, discarding is resulting in vast volumes of fish being killed and thrown back at sea. This is environmentally damaging and, frankly, a shocking waste, given that many juvenile fish thrown back because they are too small to market ends up reducing the next year's catch. This issue was supposedly made illegal in 2019, but we know it continues. Fifthly, President Officer, Labour believes that a fairer share of catching opportunities should be secured for Scottish fishers. Scottish fishers have not been served well by the trade and cooperation agreement between the UK Government and the EU. The seas around Scotland contain some of the most productive, valuable and diverse fisheries to be found anywhere. However, Scottish vessels currently account for a minority of the total tonnage and value taken from them. So, as well as reforming how quotas are allocated in Scotland to ensure they are distributed more fairly on social, economic and environmental grounds, a focus of Scottish ministers in negotiations should be on securing a greater share of the fishing in Scottish waters for Scotland's fishers. President officer, Labour will assess and hold to account ministers on our five tests in the current round of coastal negotiations and beyond on whether they deliver a better redistribution of fishing quotas to smaller boats who are the backbone of the fishing fleet, whether they lead to landing more in our Scottish ports, creating the jobs our coastal communities' needs, and whether they genuinely deliver a sustainable fishing industry for the benefit of our environment and for the benefit of all our coastal communities. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Smith. I now call on Beatrice Wishart for around four minutes. Ms Wishart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I too would like to pay tribute to all our fishermen and the dangerous job that they do and along with all who work in the f uh, fishing industry to put food on our tables. I won't be the first to raise with the Cabinet Secretary the disparity between the scientific assessment of fish stocks, particularly cod, and the reality on the fishing grounds. I'm told the disparity has widened to the point where the credibility of the fisheries management system is under threat. Shetland fishermen are seeing abundant cod on the fishing grounds, but some vessels face bankruptcy if the quota is cut again. As it has been put to me, it's one thing to have fishing vessels going bankrupt if fish, if fish stocks disappear, but quite another to engineer a situation where they go bankrupt amid the largest fish stocks seen in the North Sea for the last two decades. 
I understand an increasing number of fishery scientists have grown uneasy over the ISIS stock assessments. While ISIS itself says it is willing to engage with the fishing industry to improve data collection and the way that data is interpreted. The trouble is that that all takes time, years of time. That could mean vessels going bankrupt. In turn, coastal and island communities would face a crisis, all of which could be avoidable. Shetland may be small and perfectly formed, but we are a large ocean community right in the heart of the North Sea and North Atlantic. We rely on the seas and those working on and around it. To that end, I'm frequently in touch with the Shetland Fishermen's Association. The SFA, along with colleagues on the mainland, have called for the introduction of an expert panel to advise ministers on ISIS advice every year. There's concern about the quality of scientific advice, both in the at-sea data gathering exercise that feeds into annual ISIS assessments and the reference points that ISIS uses to recommend total allowable catches or tax. The headline recommendation from ISIS in respect of North Sea Cod is a 10.3 reduction in the 2022 TAC. This is where negotiators feel bound to start from, and they need reasons to depart from that advice if there's going to be an agreement to an increase rather than a decrease of COD tax. There are several reasons I would like to raise about ISIS advice and increase North Sea COD quotas next year. According to ISIS, the North Sea COD quota can be increased substantially in 2022 without sacrificing increases in the stock size. Modelling indicates that the spawning stock biomass, or SSB, of this species would increase by 24% between now and 2023 if the TAC was doubled. More modest increases in the TAC would lift the SSB by almost as much as the ISIS recommended 10.3% cut. The second point, ISIS reference points for North Sea Cod, is the largest size the stock has reached in the period from 1998 to 2021, almost 98 tonnes. This happens to be the highest figure for the last 40 years as well, which means that the system is trying to raise the North Sea Cod SSB le to levels that, according to the advice, cannot be reached by 2023, even without any fishing at all. Thirdly, North Sea demersal fisheries are mixed fisheries, with cod being caught at the same time as several other species during typical fishing operations. An acute shortage of cod quota in a situation of cod abundance is restricting the fleet's capacity to catch species for which it does have quota. To conclude, presiding officer, the immediate priorities for Shetland's fleet in this year's talks are to an agree an increase in the North Sea cod quota, to avoid a cut in the link quota, as the only evidence available to ISIS shows the stock to be three times larger than it was 20 years ago, and to keep up pressure on neighbours to reverse the unilateral increases in macro quotas announced this year. Two final points. The Cabinet Secretary may be aware from her visit to Shetland of the view of local fishermen that they are unfairly targeted by fisheries protection vessels compared to those from non-UK countries. I urge transparency in the publication of figures relating to that issue. And finally, perhaps next year, consideration might be given to holding at least one round of coastal states talks in Shetland, the heart of Scotland's richest fishing grounds. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms Wishart. We now move to the open debate. The first speaker will be Jenny Minto for around four minutes, be followed by Jamie Halker-Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. <clears throat> The Scottish Government's position has always been to deliver the best outcomes for Scotland's fishing in interests, a world-class fishing nation delivering responsible and sustainable fisheries management and communities. Put simply, fish, folk, future. I was brought up in the East Nuke of Fife. Fish was a constant through my childhood. My father's accounting business supported fishers. My higher geography project was on the development and sustainability of East Nuke fishing. And of course, a fish supper at Ainster Harbour was a top treat. I studied in Aberdeen and came face to face with the bigger industrial fishing industry there. As an accountant, I audited fishing businesses, reconciling catches with quotas. And now, living in Argyll and Butte, I represent a different but extremely important element of Scotland's fishing industry, the West Coast inshore fishers. I thank those that work so hard in this industry. Fisheries is con correctly a devolved matter. There are significant differences in the industry within Scotland and across the UK. Differences should be recognised. Management of fish stocks needs to be tailored to individual circumstances. 
and I am pleased that the Scottish Government, when constructing its core team for the coastal state negotiations, brought in voices and experiences from all elements of our fishing industry, including Communities Inshore Fisheries Alliance. This is a community-based organisation with the main aim of addressing the economic and physical needs of the Scottish inshore fisheries and its associated communities and businesses. They provide local wisdom, which combined with the science can ensure the most sustainable results. Coastal communities should not be cut off from opportunities. Just because they haven't done something for a while shouldn't negate them from the chance to return to it. And they can also comment from a, sorry, from a practical perspective, for example, quota swaps from west to east and how they could impact negatively on the West Coast Fishers' Nefrots fleet if discards are lost. By bringing everyone round the table, the Scottish Government is creating the space to ensure Scotland's interests are protected. Leaving the EU has di di disproportionately impacted on Scotland. One of my fishers has lost 60% of his market and is worried about the labour impact too. And our fishing fleets have access to fewer valuable fish stocks. Until Scotland regains its independence and EU membership, the Scottish Government will continue to be actively involved in the coastal state negotiations, playing a key and active role in ensuring that Scotland's interests are protected. And the Scottish Government will be an active partner, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, at international negotiations, especially when it comes to fish stocks in Scottish waters and access to Scottish waters by foreign vessels. <clears throat> fish don't recognise international boundaries. Therefore, it is vital that they are jointly managed to ensure long-term sustainability. Fish, folk and future. So, to finish, presiding officer, as I said, I grew up in the East Nuke of Fife, home to the award-winning Scottish Fisheries Museum. Its collection traces the development of commercial fishing through the ages, including Loch Fine skiffs and Campbelltown ring nets from Argyll and Butte. It tells the story of a way of life that is so important to Scotland, one that through constant innovation has adapted and changed. Fishing survives because of the dedication of folk working often in harsh conditions. Sustainable fishing is crucial to its future. Thank you. I call Jamie Halker Johnson to be followed by Emma Harper. Around four minutes, please, Mr. Johnson. Halker Johnson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Scotland's fishing industry finds itself at an important point in its history. At the start of this year, the United Kingdom re established itself as an independent coastal state outside of the European Common Fisheries Policy. This is the basis for the negotiations that have taken place this year and for the UK's direct participation in international discussions around the industry. But of course we do not exist in isolation. We are aware of the need to work with our neighbours to provide positive results for those around the table. And more than usual, we have been reminded this week that we have a responsibility to our natural environment. While we are driven to maximise opportunity for our fishing fleet, we must do so in a way that is sustainable a way that leaves a positive legacy for future generations, as well as promoting biodiversity and securing habitats for marine life below our waters. And I applaud the sector and fishermen across the country for the work they have been doing to that end. We know around this chamber that the process of transition has involved problems for the sector. In the last year, we saw a number of competing issues that have co had costs for our fishing fleet. Border arrangements in particular have been challenging as importers and exporters as well as border agencies adjusted to, changes, to change rules at our frontier. So it was important that government was able to respond. And I welcomed in particular the creation of the Scottish Seafood Exports Task Force, which brought together government sector representatives and other stakeholders to drive improvements. That was a positive step. But it was also clear that direct support was also essential. The £23 million package of support for exporters in the sector built on the 100 million UK seafood fund demonstrating a will and action to back British fish and to work through the issues that have arisen. It's a reminder that we should also be looking to the future, investing in the sector, not only on existing trading, uh, not only on existing trading links with our closest neighbours, but seizing opportunities to expand them with partners around the world. This year, the Scottish Fishermen's Federation praised the tireless work of Team UK, in which we include Marine Scotland, around negotiations. The benefits of working together uh, cannot be overstated. Quite properly, the discussions around the 2020 allowable catches and rules began quickly after arrangements 
with the EU for 2021 were concluded. It is in everyone's interest that the processes are prompt and certainty is provided at an early stage. The same principle applies in our relations with Norway. But of course, it's worth reminding ourselves that this year's negotiations took place against the backdrop not only of a new relationship after leaving the EU, but as with virtually every employer in the country, a pandemic that has unpredictable effects on demand, logistics and supply. We have also seen the dispute with the French government and the questions that raised. There is no denying that recent times have been testing for the sector, but equally I am confident that it can and will thrive. My own region, the Highlands and Islands, has a long association with the fishing industry. There has been considerable change in the past decades, but the seafaring spirit of many of our communities is at the heart of their local identities. We have also had additional challenges as well. Shetland is one of Scotland's main, fisheries, uh, main ports for fish landing, as Beatrice Wishart pointed out. But it is also dependent on travel links with and from the islands themselves to get produce to market, even domestically. This is at the extreme end of a scale that affects all remote and rural fishing communities. Presiding officer, we remember when part of the common fisheries policies, that was, there was wide agreement around this chamber that Scotland's fishing fleet deserved better. Scotland has, a long, uh, has, uh, Scotland has a long, close association with the sea. And as with other parts of our food and drink sector, Scotland's fish exports are recognized as a quality product with a positive reputation. We believe in growing opportunity for the sector, in investing and ensuring that a positive, sustainable future can be assured. And I will welcome any work that, that, that both the Scottish and UK governments can bring forward to build that future. Thank you. I, I now call Emma Harper to be followed by Rosa Grant around four minutes, please, Ms. Harper. Thank you, President Officer. The majority of fish stocks of interest to Scottish fishermen straddle international boundaries and there are significant differences across the four nations in the UK and the need for fishing to be tailored to our Scottish circumstances is important. Brexit has seriously damaged the Scottish fishing sector. People in Scotland did not vote for the UK's hard Brexit and chaotic fisheries policy. In contrast, I welcome this, that Scotland is committed to upholding its international reputation as a good global citizen. The Scottish Government has repeatedly demonstrated Scotland's commitment to the European family of nations, reflecting the will of Scottish voters. The UK Government's isolationism, acting alone as a sovereign coastal state, undermines these efforts. Indeed, Scotland continues to pay the price for Tory Brexit. Presiding officer, the UK Government have sold out Scotland's fishing sector. Industry experts predict that the UK fishing industry will make an eye-watering loss of £300 million by 2026 as a result of the UK Government's disastrous Brexit deal. This is despite Boris Johnson promising a sea of opportunity for Scotland's fishermen. The PM's sea of opportunity was supposed to benefit to the tune of £148 million by 2026 if they voted to leave the EU. But Gary Taylor, a former DEFRA official and fisheries negotiator, estimated that fishing firms are facing losses of £64 million a year. The grave predictions have prompted the National Federation of Fishermen's Organisations to request that the UK Government urgently publish an analysis of the cost of their disastrous Brexit. And the CEO of NFO, Barry Dees, he said that there are very few winners and a great many losers in the fishing industry as a result of Brexit. I welcome this is not the approach the Scottish Government is taking for the Scotland's fishing sector. Instead, the Scottish Government's negotiation strategy and priorities are influenced by high-quality science and take into account wider policy objectives, including social economic implications. And as the Minister has stated, she has highlighted the 12-point action plan in the future fisheries management strategy. And the negotiation approach is underpinned by a set of guiding principles that will remain consistent each year and are consistent with the need to progress towards good environmental status. The Scottish Government will con conduct negotiations on a principled rather than positional basis and will comply fully with a range of international conventions and obligations, including the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. This will allow sustainably managed stocks using total allowable catches where appropriate, including through considering introducing tax for current non-quota species. 
This is the approach I want to see in Scotland, as opposed to the shambolic ideological stance which has been taken by the UK Government. The UK Government negotiated in principle just by leaving the EU, not actually working for the industry. Brexit has already had a huge impact across my South Scotland region, and it hit Dumfries and Galloway fishermen particularly hard. Only in December 2020, many boats, including ones that operate out of Kirkubri and Garleston harbours in DNG, were tied to shore as businesses became unviable and were almost out of business completely. This is all because on the 31st of December, new IT systems, regulatory, welfare and customs checks came into force for Scottish seafood exporters going to Europe, despite calls for a six-month transition period so that new systems and checks could be trialled. This was refused by the UK Government to the utter disbelief of the Scottish fishing sector. In preparation for today, I obtained a direct quote from a local fish processing business who stated that although things have stabilised slightly, uncertainty still remains a huge concern because we do not know where we will be in 12 months. Presiding officer, I welcome the approach the Scottish Government are taking to these negotiations and I look forward to Scotland, as Ms Rachel Hamilton has commented, I look forward to Scotland being an independent, normal independent coastal state, able to choose our own path and make our own decisions, presiding officer. I now call uh, Rhoda Grant to be followed by Karen Adam. Up to around four minutes, please, Ms Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, these negotiations are different this year, but they must be underpinned by sustainability and science, ensuring the economic benefit to our communities is maximised while protecting stocks and the environment. This debate takes place during COP26, and the goals we expect world leaders to realise must be at the forefront of our own deliberations. Brexit also looms large, meaning that these negotiations are very different from those that have come before and in many ways will set the scene for the future. Regardless of how we feel or voted around Brexit, our negotiators must have the best interests of our country, environment and industry as their primary focus. We must try and realise the vision of a sea of opportunity. In these negotiations, it is the Scottish Government's responsibility to ensure effective management of fisheries, to ensure they deliver the best possible outcome for the industry, our communities and our environment. Getting that balance right is key to a sustainable future and a sustainable industry. We should strive to follow scientific advice on quotas, but also take steps to protect fisheries from effort shift we have seen in the past that this has almost caused the collapse of sustainable fisheries on the West Coast, something that Jenny Minto talked about earlier. Having MSE certification of our fisheries will be more important going forward as we see people awakening to sustainability and protecting our planet. We also have issues regarding distribution of quota. We have the opportunity now to move to a different pattern of distribution and management. As Colin Smith said, currently our smaller vessels lose out to those who own and operate larger boats because quota distribution penalises the smaller fleet. The Scottish Government must address this issue. They must look at our own fleets and the communities for good practice. For example, Shetland Islands Council owns quota that is leased to local boats on the understanding that they land their catch locally as well. This needs investment in food processing in an area where there are staffing shortages. Scottish Government need to look at careers in the processing sector and how to make them more attractive. The problem of bycatch is still to be solved sustainable, sustainably, and I've long advanced a system where quota can be bought for bycatch at the point of landing. The price of this quota would make it possible to land bycatch without detriment, but without profit as well. There also needs to be stiffer penalties on those who dispose of bycatch at sea. We have the opportunity to introduce conservation methods using science and fishing gear to be more selective in our fishing and to insist that those who access our waters do likewise. There is an opportunity this year to set and train solutions to the stubborn problems that have damaged the industry in the past. 
we need to look at transition to keep our own industry in uh, industry a greater share of the fish in our water but doing so and doing so would create a buffer when th there is a need to reduce our total allowable catch we can really farm our seas for the benefit of future generations and we must maximize the opportunity that we now face while recognizing that this is a transition for our neighbours as well. Fisheries management is the responsibility of Scottish ministers. Whilst fishers themselves have a role to play in the responsible management of the seas, it is Scottish ministers who decide how our seas are used. Because those who are concerned about their income today might not have the luxury of being able to look out for our future generations. Scottish Government must listen to the industry, look to their advice of good practice to enable them to manage our seas in a way that enables our fishing communities to thrive while also protecting our precious environment and ensuring the long-term sustainability and the future ahead. I now call uh, Karen Adam to be followed by Douglas Lumsden. Ms Adam is joining us remotely. Uh, sorry, around four minutes, please, Ms Adam. Thank you, President Officer. My constituency of Bampshire and Buchan Coast is a coastal fishing community, one of integrity with values embedded in trust and honesty. And we often see this within highly skilled and dangerous professions, because a person's word and integrity can mean the difference between life and death, posterity or hunger. The fishing industry has gone through many changes over the last few hundred years diversifying from whaling ports through to today, catching, landing and processing first-class seafood exported all over the world. We are extremely lucky to have that on our doorstep, a major contributor to local jobs and our food supply chain, and a global standard highlighting to the world what Scotland has to offer. The topic for to debate today is Scotland's approach to 2021 coastal states negotiations. If there is something I wish to get across in my speech today, it's that within all these discussions and debate, we must remember those at the heart of it all. We must listen to those with lived experience and those within the communities, those that have felt for too long that they have been played by politicians to leverage deals. With international relations being a reserved matter, it should be an essential ask that the UK government listen to Scottish ministers, officials, and fishing and industry representatives before they take, undertake any negotiations, and not least the very people living and working in it, not just to listen, but also to act on the advice given, particularly when the rhetoric of more fish to catch is thrown around, without the sense to acknowledge that it's the type of fish that matters. Excuse the pun, but a red herring. Design officer, at the beginning of this year, Fergus Ewing spoke to this chamber and painted a picture that illustrated how proud and historical fishing communities are left reeling as they feared the great Tory betrayal of Scottish fishing interests, and how right he was, along with the fishing industry. I do believe that there is an underlying truth increasingly evident. I do not believe that those at Westminster proposing to care about our fishing and coastal communities in Scotland actually do so. Their deeds do not match their words. They may enjoy the finest seafood in fancy restaurants, but the people in the industry, the processors, the producers, those that risk their lives out on the sea, I doubt that they care too much about them or the coastal communities in which they have lived for hundreds of years. As has been mentioned, the Tories promised Scotland's fishermen a sea of opportunity and the benefits of an independent coastal state. But instead, they have been exposed. As Elspeth Macdonald, chief executive of the Scottish Fishermen's Federation, put it, the UK is now a coastal state with one hand tied behind our back. Those broken promises leave our fishermen woefully short of their expectations, and their sense of betrayal is evident in their responses. Our vision for Scotland is to be a world-class fishing nation, delivering responsible and sustainable fisheries management. And my meetings throughout the summer with stakeholders made it clear that to mitigate the shortfall in available quota and deliver the best possible management structures in our waters, we must include in discussions the very people our plans directly affect. For example, marine health, our path to net zero, our good food nation and our economy, 
depend on us including these coastal communities and fishing workforces in plan making, as it is them we are asking to enact it. It is those who have suffered immense hardship and chaos because of political choices, whose trust we need to build if we are to succeed in any of our aspirations. Design officer, I finish by saying that we know we have challenges ahead, that our fishing industry is under immense pressure. So I ask that above all else, we take the example of the people I represent and cultivate that fishing community spirit. Be people of our word, and although difficult decisions lay ahead, we can have a prosperous and sustainable future, ensuring that our fishing communities thrive for generations to come. Thank you. I now call Douglas Lumsden to be followed by Ariane Burgess around uh, four minutes, please, Mr Lumsden. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, can I start my contribution today by thanking everyone involved in our fishing industry for all the hard work they do, catching fish in all sorts of weather, to bring high quality food to our plates, while also playing a vital part in the North East economy. The UK Government have secured a deal that means we are now an independent coastal state with control over our own waters for the first time in decades something our fishermen asked for. Our fishing community can now be sure of a government who stands up for their livelihoods rather than faceless bureaucrats in Brussels deciding their fate. As a result of the UK's exit from the EU, we're now in a position to develop our own policies in relation to fishery matters. In doing so, the UK government indicated in its 2018 Sustainable Fisheries White Paper that is intended to be a champion of sustainable fisheries in every part of the UK. And we can now directly improve the sustainable... Yes, I will. Alistair Allen. I thank the member for giving way. If uh, the picture uh, painted by um, the member of, of Brexit is such an unqualified success, can he explain why fish processing businesses in my constituency cannot find a workforce in many cases? Dr Slumson. I think that's a, an interesting um, argument that the, the member raises, that we should be so dependent on immigration as we as we go forward. I think when you think about immigration, that obviously means we're taking people and resource away from other countries. And we have to think whether that's a moral thing to do or whether we should be looking at modernising the industry that we, we have and uh, growing the, uh, the, the fishing industry that way. So the focus of the UK government on levelling up also extends to our fishing fleet in Scotland with a new 100 million UK seafood fund. It will ensure that fish that are landed in the UK are processed in the UK, creating job opportunities across the supply chain. It will upskill the workforce and train new entrants, as well as investing in technology to put the UK at the cutting edge of new safe and sustainable fishing methods. What is certain is that the UK government must secure the best deal for our fishing fleet in the, in the negotiations moving forward. And the Scottish Fisheries Federation has commended DEFRA and Marine Scotland for working tirelessly on these arrangements. The SNP government are currently undermining our, undermining our fishing industry with undue concern and insecurity about their future. The Scottish Fisheries Federation are rightly concerned about the coalition of chaos of the SNP and the Greens. They have been fishing in a sustainable way for many, many years. There can be few industries more aware of the impact of environmental change or doing more to preserve our oceans and fish stocks. We have to support their efforts, not put more barriers in their way. And I hope that ministers will join me to meet leaders of the industry to understand their concerns and help them flourish. And, President Officer, I have a plea for this SNP Green government. Instead of always being negative, why not try and be positive and help support the fishing industry? Play your part in supporting the industry, and I will even give them a few suggestions where this devolved government can help. Work with the UK government to promote our fishing industry. Support the 100 million fishing UK seafood fund. And then look at the powers you have, such as transport. The transport links to Peterhead are a disgrace. No rail so producers have to rely on a single track road past the notorious toll of Burness. If you cared about the fishing industry, you would sort this out. Fish processors reluctant to invest in improved buildings in Aberdeen because they would face a crippling business rates bill. If you cared about the fishing industry, you would sort this out. And look at the lack of investment in new automation equipment. If you cared about the fishing industry, you would sort this out. Ministers, you have the power, you just need to use them. 
Presiding officer, in conclusion, this is an industry with a bright future within the UK, and I hope that the devolved SNP Green government will step up to the plate and support them in the same way that the UK government is doing. It appears this devolved government want to preside over failure. They seek failure to sow division and promote their nationalist cause. Well, we won't let that happen. We will defend the fishing industry from this coalition of chaos, and we will ensure it has a bright future. Thank you. I now call Ariane Burgess to be followed by Alistair Allen. Uh, around four minutes, please, Ms Burgess. Thank you. And I'd like to start by thanking the fishers who risk their lives every day and everyone involved in the sector who provide food for us here in Scotland and abroad. Presiding officer, today's debate, as we've heard, is an annual debate about neg negotiations on fishing quotas. Yes, we must talk about quotas, but if we want to ensure we can talk about quotas 10 years from now or 100, we should look at the whole way we manage our seas. With COP26 happening in Glasgow, all week we've been talking about taking action to ensure a future for young people. If we want to pass on to them a vibrant fisheries sector, we must design Scotland's fisheries in a way that preserves fish stocks for future generations. What we've got right now is layers of sticking plaster policies that don't tackle the problems of overfishing, the crisis in our inshore environments, and the sheer unfairness of how quotas are currently distributed. <laughs> Presiding officer, the system needs to be completely redesigned as a coherent whole to, mo to promote social, environmental, and economic benefits for all and deliver fisheries I, I don't think for the future. The, the Scottish Greens look forward to working with and encouraging the Scottish Government to fulfil the commitments in the shared policy programme, including to consult on a cap to fishing activity in inshore waters and to deliver a suite of highly protected marine areas to enable habitats to recover, which will lead to far more productive seas. But we must go further. From speaking with stakeholders, I've learned that together we must end overfishing. Yes, I'll take an inter intervention. Rachel Hamilton. Thank Ariane Burgess for taking an intervention. I think it's important to um, state in the Chamber today the position of the SNP um, Green Coalition in terms of its uh, a point of joint rejoining the CFP and in independent Scotland. Is that, is that your position? Ariane Burgess. I think that the, the position for Scotland needs to be that um, Scotland needs to... Um, the Scottish people need to truly have a voice and Scotland needs a seat at any negotiation table, wherever it is. We must, so um, to continue, we must ensure better enforcement and higher fines for infringements into marine protected areas. Only days ago the alarm was raised of a trawler dredging in a protected area near Gerloch, moving off in the morning only ret to return later that day because of our lack of enforcement. We say 30% of our seas are protected, but I have heard stories of fishers who feel unable to speak out about illegal incursions into MPAs due to intimidation from other fishers. We need action on this. We must redistribute quotas to benefit more fishers and local food systems by providing local jobs and food. Quotas are currently given in a highly centralized way to a few individuals. Allocating quotas based on previous track records, as we do now, just means that those with the highest quotas now will end up with even more. A redistrib redistribution of quotas would unlock coastal communities and enable more people to make a living from the public good, which is our seas. And we must establish a process which incentivizes more selective and environmentally sensitive forms of fishing. Dredging and trawling releases much carbon into the water column as the entire aviation sector releases into the atmosphere. We must protect the blue carbon stored in our seabed and increase its ability to act as a vital carbon sink. One way to do this could be to add environmental conditionality to quotas, like we do on agricultural support payments. And finally, we must bring about a just transition, one that supports those in the sector to move to regenerative ways of working, prioritizes economic opportunities in restoring the inshore environment and puts long-term investment into skills development in regenerative fishing methods. 
Presiding officer, for a nation with so much coastline, we should be doing so much better for coastal communities. If we can do what I've outlined, we will be able to pass on to future generations healthy, thriving seas from which everyone can benefit. Thank you. I now call Alistair Allen to be followed by Mike Kumara. Around four minutes, please, Dr Allen. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The fisheries negotiations are, if not exactly a festive occasion, uh, at least a predictable feature of the Advent season. This year, the UK has, of course, ensured itself less influence over the negotiations than ever before. The last few years could be described as challenging at best for Scotland's fishing industry and for our coastal communities as a whole. The combination of Brexit and the COVID-19 pandemic have resulted in huge losses of income and even the closure of some entire fishing enterprises. And so it is important that Scotland's voice is heard in whatever indirect way Scotland can ensure that in the ongoing coastal states negotiations. With the talks surrounding 2021's catch agreements only being concluded in the summer, it is a cautiously hopeful sign that the negotiations for 2022 seem to be proceeding in a more timorous manner, with agreements for pelagic stocks being signed at the end of October. But despite the swifter progression uh, of the next coastal states negotiations, Scotland's fishermen still face a myriad of difficulties. Though fishermen were promised that Brexit would bring welcome benefits to their businesses, the last-minute deal instead sacrificed the needs of the Scottish fishing industry all too quickly. Who can forget the gridlocks at the Anglo-French border or the Northern Irish ports in January of this year, with tons of good quality Scottish produce going to waste due to the mountains of additional paperwork and costs brought about by Brexit? Labour shortages, which I noticed one member from the Conservative benches seemed to completely casually dismiss as irrelevant, uh, were already a concern for both the catching and processing sectors, not least in my own constituency in the Western Isles, and have been further exacerbated this year against the backdrop of a lack of seasonal workers across multiple industries. Presiding officer, um, as, as we've heard uh, from the government today, the protection of our marine environment is one of the most important ways Scotland can be a world leader in terms of carbon. And uh, Scotland's seas are estimated to hold more carbon than the total stored in land resources, such as our peatlands, forests and so soils. However, I want to say that fishing does deserve a future as part of all this, a future in which designations are managed at a genuinely local level and where the concerns of some of our most fragile communities are listened to. It is essential that those working in the fishing industry can access the right government information, support and initiatives. And it seems that support schemes are in high demand, given that the Marine Fund Scotland was uh, suddenly closed at the beginning of October due to the high level of applications for the funding. I am pleased that Marine Scotland, in their own words, have taken stock of the Marine Fund Scotland commitments and have therefore decided to reopen the fund uh, as of Monday this week. Presiding officer, um, to conclude, Scotland's fishing industry is a vital component of the economic, social and cultural life uh, of communities around Scotland's coastline. In my own constituency, it represents overwhelmingly small businesses and small concerns and I hope that the coastal states negotiations provide a platform by which to remind ourselves as much as any other country of that fact and the importance of that fact in the months and the years that lie ahead. I call uh, Michael Mara to be followed by Audrey Nicko. Around four minutes, please, Mr Mara. Thank you, President Officer. I'm delighted to be speaking in this important debate this afternoon. The fishing industry is of national importance to Scotland, of course, but is integral to constituents in my region, uh, particularly, of course, in and around Peterhead and Fraserburgh and across the many smaller fishing ports along the North East Coast. The industry is one so often at the forefront of the rhetoric in the constitutional limbo into which two governments have led us, but so often in the background of real considerations. So often it is used as a symbol of national pride, of culture and of history, but so often it is contemporary needs that are forgotten. Its importance is often heralded, but where investment rarely follows those pronouncements. So the negotiations we are discussing today are incredibly important. 
And the voice of the industry and those communities who form that industry must be the ones who drive our position. This is, of course, within the context of Brexit, where those on the Conservative benches drove the industry to the front and centre of their analysis of the future of the UK, only to bring chaos to that industry following a deal with the EU, which failed to deliver on the promises that they had made. The scale of the industry remains significant. Too often, Scottish fishing is discussed in an industry of the past as a remnant of a Scotland that is gone, but that simply doesn't bear any real analysis. Latest figures show nearly 400,000 tonnes landed by Scottish vessels in a year, with a value of around £600 million. That is invaluable economic activity, and as Colin Smith talked about earlier on, much more can and should be done to capture economic activity on these shores in the communities uh, where our fishing uh, fleet is based and can be expanded. The product itself is something we should cherish and which we should consume ourselves more of. A national diet containing more fish would be a healthier diet, and we must consider how our food system makes that more attractive and affordable. I believe that great days remain ahead for Scottish fishing, and that is why these negotiations are integral to the Scottish Government doing more to protect and to enhance the industry. Colin Smith very clearly set out Scottish Labour's approach to these talks, which includes a commitment to regeneration and investment within the communities which support and house the fishing industry. And it's clear that investment is key to the industry's future. I believe Rhoda Grant set out a compelling case for the application of new technologies to ensure sustainability in our fishing industry for the long term. And I think there's much more that our government can do to support innovation in these areas. But not only do we need the physical infrastructure of keys, processing facilities and logistics for the industry to thrive, we need places and people as well. There can be no bright future for an industry which is based in locations where there has been a chronic lack of investment for generations, where young people often do not stay, and where the skills pipeline is based on opportunity rather than a structure that is put in place to plan for industry and expansion, which is the role of the government that we need to hear more about. Within these discussions, we must absolutely remember our environmental obligations and our sustainable fishing commitments more important to the industry, frankly, than to anyone else, and to work with them to ensure that those obligations are met. I wish the government well in these negotiations and hope that our constructive feedback can form part of their position in these talks. I now call uh, Audrey Nicholl, who will be the last speaker in the open debate. Around four minutes, please, Ms Nicholl. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate and thank other members for their contributions. As a child, I spent every Saturday morning being dragged to Aberdeen Fish Market, where my father, then an accountant in the fishing industry, there seems to be a theme here, stood staring at landing prices on a big chalkboard. Then, as now, we took this wonderful food source for granted. The 2021 Coastal States negotiations are a crucial event for Scotland's fish producers, processors and the wider supply chain, as well as an important forum to discuss how coastal states can work together to ensure the fishing industry is sustainable in the long term. The UK Government's decision to impose a hard Brexit during a pandemic has predictably made these negotiations harder than they would otherwise have been. Across Scotland, over 12,000 people are employed in the fishing and processing industries, worth over £2.2 billion in 2018. According to Peter Cook from Opportunity North East, the turnover of the local seafood processing sector is around £700 million per annum, accounting for 32% of total North East food and drink sales. I'm proud that my constituency of Aberdeen South and North Kincardine is home to several local processing businesses. Recently, I spent Small Business Week meeting local businesses in the constituency, including two local processors, long-standing family-run businesses producing specialty products using fish sourced across Scotland. Both businesses are a key part of the local economy, employing skilled local workers, supplying the local food and drink sector and exporting their products as far afield as China. But it's been rough. 
Both found themselves navigating the COVID-19 pandemic when along came the disaster that is Brexit. The resultant uncertainty over workforce availability, export cost increases and diminishing export markets. Despite this, both businesses have shown extraordinary resilience. Only in September, John Ross, Master Curer and Smoker, celebrated their Gold Star Award from the Guild of Fine Foods for their whisky smoked salmon. Jay Charles, a third generation family run business, took the brave decision to expand their online business during the pandemic, remaining open and building up online deliveries. This is now a thriving part of their business. At the last meeting of the North East Scotland Fisheries Development Partnership, Mike Park of the Scottish White Fish Producers Association updated on the challenges that quota constraints and loss of access to fishing grounds in Norway and Faroe were having on the industry. The importance of the coastal negotiations, therefore, cannot be underestimated if we are to continue to have a thriving processing sector. According to Andrew Charles, it is absolutely vital that robust sustainable science supports the total allowable catch, agreed and total accountability of the stock catch is properly managed and policed. As an independent coastal state, it is therefore vital that we have a robust independent fisheries management force. The failure of the Scottish Government to build good working relationships with our nearest and most important quota trading partners will regrettably require robust policing going forward. In that regard, I would ask the Scottish Government to provide clarity on what increases in fishery protection may have to be budgeted for now that we cannot rely on European cooperation. So to conclude, Presiding Officer, never has there been a time when these negotiations are more important and never has there been a time, in my view, when the case for independence has been so evident. I look forward to working with the Cabinet Secretary to ensure that there is success for all involved in the sector, especially for businesses in Aberdeen South and North Kincardine. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will now move to closing speeches, and I call Sarah Boyack uh, to speak uh, for around six minutes. Please, Ms. Boyack. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. Um, I think, to the most part, this has actually been a very good debate this afternoon. There's been some very constructive comments, and there's clear agreement on the need to support our coastal communities and our fishing industries, but to do so in the context of the climate and nature emergency and to deliver sustainable fishing. And as my colleagues have laid out, Scottish believer, Labour believes that we need to be looking at the coastal state negotiations and address five key areas in it. And Colin Smith outlined them at the start. And I'll just summarise them again, because they are crucial, I think. Firstly, to prevent overfishing, to enhance local food supply chains. Secondly, for an immediate review of how new and existing quotas are allocated. Thirdly, to end fish being landed abroad. I'm going to come back to that and to invest in building capacity and infrastructure and fishing keys, as well as within the processing sector, to help regenerate our all too often neglected coastal communities. To get a fairer share and a greater share of the fishing in Scotland's waters for Scotland's fishers. And lastly, to make sure that quotas should be used to incentivise a change towards lower impact and less bycatch forms of fishing. I think these are critical issues. And as COP26 takes place, and for the events I've attended, it's absolutely clear that there's widespread agreement. We have to act now. We need to halt global warming at 1.5 degrees. That also means addressing our nature emergency, whether it's the pollution of our waters due to plastic or waste, or whether it's due to overfishing. And that's why we need to support our fishing industries going forward. It needs more political leadership from the Scottish Government. In a briefing we got in June this year, SIFT, the Sustainable Insurance Fisheries Trust, highlighted that Scotland's marine areas play a central but often overlooked role in the nation's carbon budget. The sea and many marine species and habitats, including our kelp forests, sequester carbon dioxide. And of particular importance is the role that marine sediments play in storing carbon. Scotland's sea loss are some of the richest carbon stores on earth, containing many more times, more, many more times carbon per unit than Scotland's terrestrial peatlands. Yet whilst we protect our peatlands, 
and we're looking at restoring them, marine sediments continue to be disturbed and damaged by heavy mobile fishing gears. So we need to act and we need to encourage and support sustainable local fisheries such as the Clyde Creel Fisheries and other local organisations like them. Scotland's Marine Assessment 2020 also found that fishing was the most significant and widespread pressure in Scotland's seas, noting particularly that bottom trawling and other mobile bottom catching fishing methods have led to widespread changes in our ecosystem. So we need to address those methods, reduce them, and also incentivise change. That's critical for our industry for the future. And additionally, discarding practices are resulting in vast volumes of fish being killed and thrown back at sea. This is environmentally damaging, but it also contributes to food waste. And given that many are juvenile fish throwing back because they're too small to market, it reduces next year's fish catch. So this issue was a, a, supposedly made illegal in 2019, but apparently continues today as an open secret within the fisheries management. And most egregiously, an additional uplift quota was created and given to help transition to no discard fisheries, but rather than incentivising change, it has actually been used by some in the fishing sector to continue to discard, compounding overfishing and resulting in yet more environmental harm. So now is the time to use the powers set out in the 2020 Fisheries Act and create marine protection areas. The Arran Marine Protected Area is a perfect example of the benefits of this kind of protection. It vastly improves the seabed and biodiversity in the area, but it also provides a safe haven for fry and increases fishing yields in the surrounding areas. And there's also, also good evidence of how the Gaelic language is helping protect our fisheries through the local knowledge passed down through generations. So it's a cultural issue as well as an industry one, and it shows how deeply intertwined our communities are with the seas that they work with and the need for us to support them at that local level. Now, it's been an interesting uh, set of exchanges across the chamber where there's been disagreements. At the end of the day, fisheries management is the responsibility of Scottish ministers. And while fishing communities themselves have a key role to play in responsible management of the seas, Scottish ministers do have a critical role in deciding how our seas are used. And fewer incomprehensible regulations can result in a race to the bottom. This is a powerful parliament, so I hope we use the agreement we have across the chamber to support more decisive action. And I, I just want to comment on the vital contribution fishing makes to local economies. I think that's been some of the most powerful and emotional contributions today, because colleagues know that. Fishing is an industry at the heart of many communities, with a history and a culture of its own, and we need to protect that. So I want to just say that I think I find it really ironic today that some of the Conservative contributions about Brexit um, were just not, just not accepting the reality of the impact. If you look at the impact on demersal fishers, for example, in Douglas Ross's own area, fish are being landed abroad, bypassing Scotland's economy, our food system and jobs. And many of these large fishing businesses are, have elected to land the fish they catch directly abroad to processing factories. So we need change because jobs are flying out of the northeast fishing towns Skippers have been on the brink of financial ruin, as others have said, and yet the Conservatives are patting themselves on the back. 55% of mackerel caught by Scottish fishing vessels last year was landed directly to a, fo a foreign port. That cannot be acceptable, and we need action. So I would finish by saying we urgently need the Scottish and the UK governments to work together. We know they are not going to agree, but they have to represent. The Scottish Government has to be respected, has to be at the top table with the UK Government. We need engagement, we need the sharing of expertise and knowledge. And crucially, as Michael Mara said, we need to make sure that funding that was mentioned by MSPs across the Chamber actually reaches our coastal communities to support the sustainable fishing and the jobs that we have all said today we support. So let's get that constructive collaboration. People do not need to agree on everything, but to support our fishing communities, to support our environment, and crucially, jobs in our local communities, we do need that working together. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. I now call on Donald Cameron to speak for around seven minutes, please, Mr Cameron. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I begin by apologising for arriving slightly late in the chamber for the start of the debate? Um, and I missed the first minute of the Cabinet Secretary's speech. Um, can I make up for that by um, uh, traditionally, uh, at, during this debate, this annual debate, uh, offering best wishes to her in the upcoming negotiations, not least because it will be the first time that she has participated 
in uh, those negotiations as Cabinet Secretary. And these benches hope that she secures as beneficial a deal as possible for Scotland's fisheries sector working in tandem with the UK Government. Can I also offer the thanks from these benches to all those who work in that sector, whether they be the some 4,700 4, uh, fishers employed on Scottish registered vessels, those who work in our processing firms, or those who work to promote our fantastic fish and shellfish products. COVID-19 has brought immense logistical challenges to all sectors of the economy, not least our fishing industry. And we praise on these benches all the work that those in this industry have done to adapt to the rapidly changing environment produced by the pandemic. It has been a volatile time indeed. As a Highlands and Islands MSP, I'm highly aware of the importance of this sector to the areas that I represent. And as a result, we must treat this debate uh, and the upcoming negotiations with the utmost seriousness. Uh, this was a point, I think, made by both Rhoda Grant and Colin Smith, um, that it's important to recognise that variety within the fishing sector. They spoke about the, the fact that we must uh, remember the smaller boats as well as the, the larger vessels, uh, the larger boats, larger businesses in the industry. But likewise, we must recognise that on the western seaboard of Scotland, uh, that uh, plainly involves more uh, nephrops fishing uh, than pelagic fishing. And it's important, I think, to acknowledge the very diverse nature of the sector uh, we're debating. Now, it is, of course, disappointing that some uh, in other parties have used this debate to resurrect old arguments about the Constitution and fight old battles over Brexit. That does nothing for our fishing industry and those who work in it. Those who work in our fishing industry want to see politicians come up with solutions to problems, not merely regurgitate the same old grievances that have plagued our politics for so long. The fact is that we are now an independent coastal state. And with that comes an ability in the long term to use that status to our competitive advantage to benefit our fishing communities and our wider economy. Yes. Thank Jim you, Fairley. Donald Cameron, for allowing me to take that, for taking that intervention. You said a moment ago that the Scottish Government should work in conjunction with the UK Government. But given since the 1970s, successive Tory um, uh, Prime Ministers have consistently let the Scottish industry down. Do you not think that the time is right now for the Scottish Government to be the lead negotiator in anything that's going forward? Donald Cameron? No, I don't at all, and I don't accept the premise of that intervention at all. Um, the fact is, we have delivered. Uh, the, the fact is, we have delivered an independent coastal state that the United Kingdom now is, and we have an ability to use that to benefit our fishing communities. Now, of course, I accept we are facing short-term challenges. We recognise that, and we want to face them head-on. And I welcome initiatives from the UK Government to mitigate the short-term impacts of Britain's exit from the EU. Others have spoken about the establishment of the £23 million seafood disruption support scheme, which is open to those who export fish and shellfish to the EU. And I also acknowledge that the UK Government has released an initial £24 million of funding from its £100 million UK Seafood Fund, which will help businesses develop technology, trial new gear and support world-class research to improve productivity and the long-term sustainability of the industry. However, the response to those short-term challenges, Deputy Presiding Officer, goes far beyond financial investment, important as that is. The UK Government has met regularly with the industry and has worked closely with Marine Scotland on the new 2021 arrangements. Now, that's been met with praise from the sector. The Chief Executive of the SFF, Elspeth MacDonald, noted that we know that the UK team has worked hard for several months to achieve the best outcome that was possible. We are very grateful to them for their efforts. It is clear, of course, that much progress has been made, but it is also evident that more must be done to secure a strong deal in the upcoming negotiations, which benefits all parts of the fishing industry. It was positive to learn, for example, that the total tonnage of pelagic landings increased by 13% in 2020 compared to 2019, and the total value of this increase by 6%. This was acknowledged uh, by the Executive Office of the Shetland Fishermen's Association, which noted that it brings a long-awaited end to past practice in which the EU used to hand substantial amounts of Scottish quota to Norway. I do, of course, recognise that disappointing reports that there were falls in both demersal and shellfish tonnage and value. But the Scottish Government's recently published uh, Scottish Sea Fisheries Statistics 2020 document suggests that that drop in tonnage was in large part due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the restrictions placed on the industry, 
and also the decline in demand from the hospitality sector during the period where restrictions were at their most severe. Now, we can't treat that as a one-off, and it's clear that we must ensure that both those specific parts of the sector can recover and thrive in the coming years. Now, unlike the SNP, who continue to put their faith in the common fisheries policy, these benches believe that the ability of the UK to deliver free trade deals with other states and trading blocs will provide opportunities for our sector to go. And I, a few years ago, I met with the owner of a local shellfish processor in Alistair Allen's own constituency, and I asked him about the opinion, his opinion of Britain's exit from the EU and how it might impact his business. And he was optimistic. He told me that the future growth of his business wasn't dependent on our membership of the EU, but rather the ability to access and benefit from the growing demand for Scottish shellfish in Asia. Now, that's not to say that many businesses in the shellfish sector haven't felt an impact from the new arrangements with the EU, and it would be wrong to suggest otherwise. More must clearly be done to help the sector in the immediate aftermath of our exit from the EU. But it is an indication that many businesses see greater opportunities beyond the confines of the EU, and it's obvious that both the Scottish Government and the UK Government should be working together to achieve these outcomes. Uh, there have been many excellent contributions across the Chamber. And uh, can, I, um, can I agree with Michael Mara when he says that there is a wider context of skills and of housing and of livelihoods in general behind what we're debating? Rachel Hamilton concentrated on the importance of getting young people into the industry. Douglas Lumsden spoke about the benefits of being autonomous as an independent coastal state. And many of the Labour uh, Party members and Ariane Burgess uh, rightly drew attention to the importance of sustainability. Uh, in the week of COP, correct, of course, to remind us that sustainability can't just be a, a catchphrase. It has to mean something in practice. So in closing, Deputy Presiding Officer, we recognise these negotiations are of immense importance. We want to see constructive talks that deliver growth across the sector. Now is the time to deliver for Scotland's fishing communities. And for that reason alone, we should all unite in seeking a positive outcome. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call on Cabinet Secretary Marie Goujon uh, to uh, wind up the debate. Uh, and around nine minutes, please, Ms Goujon. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I really just want to start by thanking everyone who's taken part in the debate today for their speeches and interventions. And I think there, there have been some constructive moments in it. And I know that there has been a wide range of views and issues uh, aired, because these are matters that affect those of us that you know live in and represent rural rural coastal and island communities but they are issues that do affect all of us and I think that the debate this afternoon it's covered a lot of different areas but I think it also shows just the breadth and the complexity uh, of our marine economy now we're approaching the annual negotiations in the spirit of cooperation and partnership with our coastal state neighbours and allies and really building on the relationships that we've established over the course of many years and we really are fortunate that we have some of the most respected and experienced fisheries managers in Europe and I'm confident that they will come back with a good deal for Scotland and the, the Scottish industry. And uh, because our positions and principles are based on th the best science, the most up-to-date evidence available, and we really look forward to negotiating with our international friends and partners on that basis. And I look forward to reporting back to Parliament on the, the conclusion of these negotiations. Now, a number of valuable points were raised in the debate, and of course, I really do want to try and address as many as possible as I can in my, my closing remarks. But for those, uh, for any that I miss, uh, I would urge members to, to contact me, and I'm more than happy to follow up. But I think, firstly, I would like to address some of the points that have been made on funding so far, and I think particularly the, uh, Rachel Hamilton talked about that in her contribution, as did a, num a number of other members. And I think it's unfair to, to paint this in a way where, you know, we're comparing and contrasting uh, uh, the approach when in Scotland we're not even getting the funds that were promised to us uh, in Brexit. Uh, we only, as I said in response to Rachel Hamilton's point, we received only £14 million of a replacement uh, European Maritimes and Fisheries Fund when we should have received £62 million. That was a, and should have been our allocation. And the UK government has actively shortchanged our coastal communities by passing our devolved government at every turn. Yes. Rachel Hamilton. Cabinet Secretary for taking the intervention. Um, it would be uh, useful for the Cabinet Secretary to set out how the 180 million transition fund um, for moving, to, moving away from the EU 
um, has worked for the fisheries industry, as well as the um, extra help that was given in terms of the, uh, the veterinary um, ca capacity with, and the centralised hub, because we haven't had any detail of that. Cabinet Secretary. Well, first of all, I think it's only right and fair that the UK government covers the costs of its approach to Brexit. I mean, that's why we're in this mess, and it's only right that the UK government uh, compensates us for it. And I will be addressing some of the other points in funding too. I, I, a point was raised about new entrants as well, and that's where the, the Marine Fund that we have in place as our repl replacement uh, to EMFF. We, uh, the funding that we do have, we are using to support young fishers uh, to purchase their first vessel, and that's uh, an element of the Marine Fund. Now, another important matter that was raised by a number of members across the Chamber today was around the IC's advice, and particularly the advice that was raised on uh, that's been put forward on COD, and that was a point in particular raised by Beatrice Wishart. Now, we recognise how challenging that advice is as it stands, and that is a priority area of focus for us going into these negotiations. And I know that officials are doing all that they can to make sure that we get as good an outcome as possible for this stock. Now, we're submitting a technical service request to ICs to get a further evaluation on the assumptions made using the most up-to-date information available. But I also want to add that the UK is is a contracting party to the ICES Convention and on the 1st of January of this year signed a, a memorandum of understanding with ICES to enable the UK to directly receive that advice and we won't hesitate to use our membership of ICES to challenge the advice or findings where we believe that that isn't robust. Now Beatrice Wisher also mentioned uh, the, the boarding I think of UK vessels and called for transparency on that regard. I just wanted to highlight that we do now proactively publish that information and I'd be happy to contact, uh, to contact uh, the member with further details of that. Now, another point I would like to discuss is the positive future that we all want for our fisheries and our seafood industry in Scotland. And I do think that that's probably the one solid point of consensus that we have across the chamber and that's emerged from the debate today. And Karen Adam also touched on a, a really important point too when she, when she mentioned the Good Food Nation. You know, our fishers provide us with a sustainable, nutritious source of protein that we all want to enjoy and ensure that all in Scotland and uh, those further afield can enjoy too. And we all want to see a successful industry in Scotland. But unlike the Tories, we can't be blind to the significant barriers that are in the way of that, that need urgent and critical interventions from the UK government. Now, Emma Harper and Alistair Allen and others mentioned uh, the processing industry and again, the critical shortages of labour that we're seeing here because of the lack of freedom of movement and the fact that, that's n uh, that an end has now been put to that. And it's, this is also because of the point blank refusal of the UK government to address this in any meaningful way. Now, well, visas have been introduced for poultry workers, for butchers, for HGV drivers, though how successful any of these will be gauging by the take-up so far is anyone's guess. There has been nothing specifically to help this sector. And when you add on to that the continual increase in costs that they're facing, the non-tariff barriers, which again Alistair Allen raised, uh, these are, are challenges that aren't going away. And some businesses are on a knife edge. I'm really sorry, I do need to make some progress. We need that immediate intervention. But we do also need to look at what we can do in the longer term to address these challenges. And of course, addressing the skills shortages and gaps is something that we are looking to address, but that can only be done in the longer term. Now, at this point, I do want to come back to funding here, because I think the Tories have talked about all the powers that have come back to ministers in Scotland. And again, I would reiterate what I said earlier, we should also get the funding to go with that and to reflect it. Now, the Tory members talked of the £100 million of funding that had been announced, but this completely bypasses devolved governments in areas of policy that are fully devolved. Now, Douglas Lumsden also mentioned uh, funding for transformation. I also want to highlight that we do provide funding for that through our Food Processing, Marketing and Cooperation Grant, which I think is important to highlight. Now, there are other, I, I just want to make reference to a few other initiatives uh, as I'm moving towards bringing the debate to a close, because this government is wholly committed to the sustainable development of the fishing industry. And we recognise that Scotland's inshore fisheries are a, a most valuable asset. They make a significant contribution to the economic and cultural fabric of our coastal and island communities. And in early uh, in 2022, we'll be consulting on the inshore fisheries management elements 
of the Scottish Green Party Agreement, which had been highlighted by Ariane Burgess. And a cap on inshore fishing activity is one of the measures, and that represents an important step in our inshore fisheries policy development. And there's a, another point that I want to address in relation to marine protected areas and highly protected marine areas, again mentioned, I think, by Ariane Burgess and as well by Sarah Boyack in her closing comments. Making space for nature is vital in addressing the twin biodiversity and climate crises, and the shared marine space has become increasingly valuable and contested, especially as net zero industries emerge and as we strive to restore the rich biodiversity of Scotland's seas. Um, marine protected areas are a vital part of that restoration process. Our Scottish Marine Protected Area Network already covers 37% of our waters, and we've committed to delivering fisheries management measures in the existing marine protected areas by 2024 and now we will go even further by designating 10 percent of our waters as highly protected marine areas by 2026. Now these will provide a higher level of protection and allow for additional recovery and enhancement of the marine environment and it's the conservation measures like these that will help to halt biodiversity loss and provide that critical buffer in our fight to mitigate and adapt to the effects of climate change and they'll protect the resources and industries that we all rely on and ensure that we can continue to benefit from our rich seas for many years and of course for many generations to come. Now the economic link is uh, one of the other ways that we'll also benefit and I think this again is an important point to highlight that I also mentioned in my opening remarks. The Scottish Government is committed to amending the economic link arrangements for Scottish fishing vessels and this will increase the amount of fish landed into Scotland and will really broaden the return to our nation from fishing and thereby extending the benefit to our coastal communities. Now, presiding officer, in drawing this debate to a, a close, I, I just want to offer a couple of final reflections. The fishing industry does face many challenges, and like many in this country, they've struggled in the past two years because of the pandemic, but they've also suffered because of uh, the botched Brexit deal, which has been inflicted on them by the Tories. Now, this government, in contrast, has a vision for the fishing industry in Scotland and a clear plan in place under our future fisheries management strategy. Now, we believe in an industry that's based on science, an industry based on evidence, and an industry that has sustainability as its core principle. Now, the outcomes we seek at the annual fisheries negotiations are aligned to this vision. We're not looking for a deal that benefits vested interests or that betrays a whole industry as the Brexit deal has done. We are committed to delivering the right deal for Scotland, a deal which allows our fishers to work today while preserving our shared marine heritage for tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And that concludes the debate. Point of order, Stephen Kerr. On a point of order, uh, Deputy President Officer, this is the third time that I've had to raise the use of government-initiated questions by the Scottish Government in announcing significant and substantive policy. Today, a draft hydrogen action plan was published by the Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero Tran Energy and Transport, backed by £100 million of public spending commitments. The announcement for this publication was done via another underhanded GIQ, S6W04328. The presiding officer has previously stated that the Scottish Government should reflect on the use of GIQs when Parliament is sitting. They have not. From the chair, the presiding officer has also stated on multiple occasions that all significant and substantive announcements should be made to the Parliament whenever that is possible. This has been ignored. Deputy Presiding Officer, I will tell members about the arguments that the SNP Minister for Parliamentary Business has made in the Bureau. The Minister has said he has encouraged Ministers to attend the Chamber to deliver statements and submit themselves to the scrutiny of members' questions, and he appears to be uncomfortable when, he, when they don't. And I take the Minister at his word. Well, Deputy Presiding Officer, we have no platform to scrutinise the action plan this week. There is now a clear pattern of disrespect shown by the Scottish Government, and I see no indication that they will change their ways. Deputy Presiding Officer, what course of action is open to us as parliamentarians if everything we do, including our scrutiny of the executive, is continuously controlled and constrained by the Scottish Government? Will you, Deputy Presiding Officer, ensure that formal guidance is issued to the Scottish Government on the use of GIQs. 
I, I thank uh, the member for his point of order. Uh, what I would say is that GIQs are a recognised mechanism through which government can make announcements. As the presiding officer has previously set out, significant announcements should be made to Parliament in the Chamber whenever possible. There will, of course, be instances in which this is not possible. I haven't had the opportunity to study in detail the GIQ referred to by the member, uh, but I would uh, remind the member, uh, firstly, that in fact there is already guidance in place, and secondly, uh, that GIQ can of course be followed up uh, with debates, and the member may wish to raise this at the Bureau. Thank you. Ms. Golden. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, last week the Scottish Government agreed to provide a statement on incineration and the much delayed deposit return scheme, yet now we have a new topic on towards a circular economy. I seek your guidance on how, how we can have full scrutiny on these incredibly important topics and I would welcome an additional statement on the circular economy. I, I, I thank the, the, the member for his contribution. Uh, I would say a few things. Firstly, the, Parliament, the Bureau discussed this matter uh, and the Parliament actually agreed to this statement uh, in terms of the subject matter proposed being made, I believe, on Wednesday of next week. I understand that's the current position. Uh, and obviously there would be the opportunity for uh, the member's business manager to uh, be of that matter in the Bureau on Tuesday of next week. But my understanding is that the substance of the statement proposed is as agreed last week. Thank you. So I, I, I was saying before these uh, contributions that uh, the debate on, which I should say I think for the record, on Scotland's approach to 2021 coastal state negotiations has been indeed concluded and it is now time to move on to the next item of business. And the next item of business is consideration of business motion 2056 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer, and moved. I don't see that any member has asked to speak on the motion, uh, and therefore I would put the question that motion 2056 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed, and the motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of two parliamentary bureau motions. I ask George Adam, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, to move motions 2057 and 2058 on designation of lead committees. Thank you, President Officer, and both moved. Thank you. And the question on these motions will be put at decision time, to which we have now come. There is one question to be put as a result of today's business, and I propose to ask a single question on two parliamentary bureau motions. Does any member object? No member objects. The question, therefore, is that motions 2057 and 2058 in the name of George Adam on designation of lead committees be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed and that uh, concludes uh, decision time and uh, we will now move on to the next item of business after a very short pause. Thank you. I've lost the last page, is that okay? <laughs>